all the unique characters. I do let them bang. Yeah, I say, like, yeah, I'm a legend, man. I'm building my legs. All the stories and perspectives featured weekly. I wasn't fully committed to that choke, and I kind of sunk into it, started squeezing tighter, and I kind of heard him gurgle a little bit. I was like, oh. And all the combat sports you could ask for in the best state in the U.S. Like I said, Ohio versus the world. It's gonna happen, for sure. Watch out. It'll be cool, man. I'm not worried about it. I'm gonna show them why the Ohio MMA scene is, in my opinion, one of the best MMA scenes in the country. This is Forged in OH. IO. OH. IO. OH. IO. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 84 of Forged in Ohio. My name is Jake Murray and I'm the host of the podcast. Last week, I featured Mark the Meat Train Gordon on the show. He's set to compete in his second pro fight on July 13th for Made Men Promotions. That's this Saturday in Cleveland, Ohio. Well, for this episode, I was able to get one half of the co-main event of that great night of fights on the show. It's a showdown of two 2-0 two pro featherweights. The fighter representing Ohio is none other than Dusty the Warrior Schaefer. Thanks for coming on the show, Dusty, and welcome to Forge in Ohio. Yeah, thank you for having me. I feel welcome. Really appreciate this. Yeah, of course, man. The, the pleasure is all mine to welcome you on to Forge in Ohio. <laughs> Let's dive right into that upcoming bout on July 13th for Made Med Promotions. How are you feeling being so close to fight night? I'm excited, man. Like, that's really the best way I could explain it. I, you know, to have an opportunity like this to test myself, that's what I live for with the sport, you know. It's always about self-improvement for me. And I'm not trying to pick battles i'm not trying to you know look for a guy who's considered like a chump or whatever i i want an actual challenge so i'm very excited for this yeah and i think it's safe to say that that's what you have in front of you on july 13th is a challenge you're fighting abyss abyssov hopefully i'm pronouncing that name right out of american top team what do you know about your opponent for the 13th uh i mean style wise i i guess he's a judo guy um you know i had first originally heard of his name when he was supposed to fight maddox jada maddox and then maddox couldn't make weight i don't know what happened there but you know that's like i like that it didn't happen because now i get the opportunity to take him on and prove myself you know so it's like that falling apart actually was like the best thing that could have happened like the timeline of everything happening because i was actually supposed to originally fight jeremy henry who Jaden just fought and lost to jeremy had accepted the fight after abbas had turned it down originally or his manager did and then about like two days later henry got back and was like yeah we're actually going to take this other opportunity i believe it was a better pay which makes sense and henry ended up going to beat him so you know, I just think the whole like try like connection there is kind of funny between me, Abbas, Henry, and uh, I should say Quad because Maddox was in the mix now. But yeah, so you like how that turned out? You like the new opponent and the new challenge ahead of you for the thirteenth? It sounds like. Yeah, I like that. It's I mean, Abbas was my original opponent, and I was ready for both of them. And you know, when Abbas. I don't know. I, I guess it was his manager who had not wanted to take the fight. So we moved on to Henry, and then Henry moved on to Maddox, and then Abbas circled back around. So it was just a cool thing because it was also Abbas that was supposed to originally fight Maddox, and Abbas also had fought Henry and beat Henry. You know, so it's like, do your MMA math there. It's it's just a it's a cool thing to me. Many people probably didn't know that, so figured I'd throw it out there. Yeah, I definitely uh, didn't know that either. Is Abyss the type of opponent that motivates you and gets you that much more excited for fight night? No, oh, yeah, like the feeling that I'm getting right now, even just talking about it, I can feel my heart start to, uh, you know, the adrenaline's pumping. I feel I feel incredible, and that's like what I love about this sport is you know I'm. I'm an adrenaline junkie. Like I, I live for high stress situations. 
Yeah, I love it, man. How do you deal with that that stress of fight week? And I know you're talking about how excited you are for July 13th, but I'm sure there's some stress and anxiety there too. You know, that's common in the fight oh. game. Yeah, there's stress, there's anxiety, there's fear, there's all of it, you know? And I take all of it in. I don't try to shut anything out. I take it for what it is and, you know, allow those feelings to have me perform that I the way that I would like to perform. I feel that, you know, if you try to like shut out that fear and that anxiety, it won't actually, you know, put you at your full best capabilities. So, and that's something that like a few legendary fighters have talked about. And I really like, it's something that's stuck with me, you know, just driving off of the fear, driving off of the anxiety. And obviously there's a lot on the line. We're both 2-0. Oh. We have, you know, this is a professional fight as well. We have a lot to lose, both of us. I'm sure he's feeling some type of way as well. But that's what's fun about this. Yeah, one O has to go, as they always say. I know you might not want to reveal his biggest weakness in your mind. You kind of mentioned how he's really good at judo. But what do you think he does well? What's his biggest strength as a fighter? Um, I think he has good distance management and he can definitely, you know, he has a little bit of grappling from what I've seen. I haven't really watched too much tape. I try not to, you know, I will, I'll, I'll dive into it a little bit, but like, I'd rather just, uh, you know, fight the way I know how to fight and put trust into it. Now there is like some things that we have tweaked for this camp just based on what we've seen. But for the most part, it's, you know, I believe in myself. Yeah, I like that. Do you think that might come, uh, like, that might come into effect later on in your career when you're fighting guys who have more experience and you're more experienced where you might watch more footage or really change and create a game plan for them? Whereas right now, you're more so worried about yourself and fighting as, you know, Dusty the Warrior Schaefer and what you've been doing your whole career so far. Yeah, I think eventually it's going to have to get to that point. Like, I like the way uh, GSP had kind of explained it with uh, his coaches. They actually would literally slow down the videos to go, like, frame by frame and then see where the openings were in a very slow pace and then start to form a game from there. Like, okay, we see, you know, he throws this attack, leaves himself open to, like, the left side. So that would be the perfect time to make an attack to the left or vice versa so yeah i mean like i've i try to uh look at this in a scientific way i guess you can say it i'm like i'm i've always been a science fanatic even growing up it was like one of my favorite subjects that i actually enjoyed not that i i did not enjoy school but you know science made it bearable science in art class so yeah, I love how you kind of incorporate that knowledge into mixed martial arts. Are there guys that maybe you looked up to while getting into the sport that kind of embrace that style as well? Or maybe now you look at and kind of admire their style? So um, I already mentioned GSP. Uh, John Jones. John Jones was the first, you know, big UFC guy that I can remember actually like being excited to watch back in the day. Um, and I just liked how like free he was, you know, like he, the, he's so unorthodox that you can't prepare for something like that. Um, I like modern day guys. I really like Charles, Charles Oliveira, um, sugar, sugar show, man, that dude, when it comes to striking, he's on another level, you know, people have mixed feelings about him. I'm a fan personally. I'd like to fight him one day. I think it'd be awesome. Um, other guys, old or new. Hmm. I was a fan of the way Connor, you know, kind of created himself as the villain and obviously did it better than pretty much anybody. Uh, Poetan, Alex Pereira, dude's a dog. I, you know, if there's a Peloton fight, I'm watching it because it is just very exciting. And then 
Sean Strickland too. I like his style. I like the way that he stands and is very comfortable within range and just has perfect timing. You know, that fight with him versus Israel where he just completely dismantled him was one of the most exciting fights that I've watched recently. Yeah, he, so. he saw that one coming, and those are that's a great list of fighters that you just listed to. Uh, you and, and Abbasov, your opponent for July 13th, you both have a decision and a submission on your record through two pro fights. Do you feel like this fight ends inside the distance, or maybe do we see the, the judges get involved here? I honestly keep having this thought, and I feel that it is not going to go the distance. I feel that it is going to be a round three, I would say. It's going to be either a submission or a knockout. That's the way I'm looking at it. That's the way I, I keep having this image in my head of how it could play out, you know, respectively. And I've had that kind of, like, that kind of imagery in my head before for previous fights. And it's like, you know, it, it really did manifest itself in a way it was kind of crazy to me that like i had like a certain it was for my amateur title fight actually i had like certain uh it was almost like foreseeing into the future in a way or i was just envisioning how it was gonna go and it really did actually like play out pretty much down to a t that way so i tried to uh meditate a lot work on my breath work and start to create that imagery yeah that's really interesting i was going to ask you about you know imagining this fight and how you foresaw it going down you see a ko or submission in the third round but the the first second and the third round leading up to that potential finish how do you see this fight going where does it take place and how do you get the job done so i really think that this is going to be a brawl i think it's going to be very entertaining for the people I think we both are going to go stand toe to toe and really like, I'm hoping that he wants to strike is the majority of my fights. You know, when I try to strike with people, all of a sudden they want to become a wrestler, which is fine with me. But like, I love to strike. Like I love to fucking stand and bang, you know? So like, I'm just like, come on, let's, let's have some fun here. We can go to the ground, but like, I want to, I want to test myself a little bit first before doing that. And you know, if it were going to be by knockout, I could see it. You know, what I'm envisioning, at least, is head kick, side kick, or elbow. Yeah, there you go. Is that what fans can expect to see out of this fight? A, a true brawl from the beginning to the end that you're foreseeing in the third round? That's the way it feels for me. I feel that this is going to be a very entertaining fight. And people are going to be locked in on it. And, you know, us being both at the levels that we are at, it, it should be that way, too. So we're not trying to have, like, as a professional, especially as a professional, like, I understand, like, some amateur fights can kind of drag out and not be too entertaining just because both guys are not, like, they don't have that experience yet. They don't, like, understand certain things yet. I feel that now I'm getting to a level where I can really like map my movements out within my head in the moments and execute. So that's, that's what I'm really excited to put to the test is just seeing the vision, seeing the flow in my head. Yeah, for sure, man. You have me excited about this fight just talking to you here. Uh, you know, this is your second straight time you fought at Neo Sports Plant for Made Men Promotions. Are you excited? Or are you expecting a big crowd for you on July 13th? Yeah, man. And that's anytime I'm fighting in this area, I'm expecting a, a good crowd. And I also like fighting at Neo, it, it, it feels like home. Even though I'm from Akron, you know, it's at least right up the road. I really like shouts out to Revolution Fight and Fitness for providing an amazing space to warm up and drilling partners as well. Just, you know, shouts out to all those guys. I really appreciate what they do. And to have that there within the venue is it's unbeatable, you know. So 
that's something I'm also really pumped about is just to have access to those amenities is it's going to be awesome. Talking with Dusty, the Warrior Schaefer here on Forge in Ohio. I want to discuss the rest of your pro career. Both fights have taken place in 2024. You debuted in January and picked up a win via armbar in the first round. What comes to mind when you think back to the pro debut? Man, I I mean, I knew that win was going to happen. I that, that crowd that I had for that fight, dude, it was just like a perfect night. Like, I had... I mean, five figures in sales for tickets, you know, it was, it couldn't have gone any better for a debut and to kind of make a statement that like, Hey, I'm not, you know, not doing this for fun. I'm not doing like, this is something that I live for, you know, and I really appreciate everyone that did make it out to support me as well. I could like, if you go back and watch, I believe there's something on YouTube. You can just hear the crowd everybody into it it was it was incredible it was a really cool feeling and to you know get the submission in the first round like it just felt easy man it felt like the nerves i, I didn't really have like because I, I got a weird thing when i'm walking to the cage where like the nerves just kind of dissipate and i try to remain as calm as possible and that fight i was locked in and it was just i knew that walking to the cage i already had this yeah i watched the so, fight on uh, on youtube and it looked like you had a triangle choke nearly locked in and then the fight stopped for a moment and i couldn't tell what happened but what happened in that sequence there yeah i made a mistake i uh <laughs> so me being um you know not paying attention to rules i didn't understand what exactly 12 to 6 elbows were so I had thrown a couple and you know they weren't hard they also were at like maybe a little bit of an angle not like straight up down but and even chukovic who was roughing it and uh, shouts out you know chukovic is probably one of my favorite referees in the state next to mcginnis so i think they're both great um he kind of hesitated at first to stop it but then did once he noticed that i had cut him and wanted to make sure that the cut was you know that he can continue and you know, shouts out to Cody Jenkins as well for wanting to continue after that. That was, you know, dude's dude's definitely not a coward. So even taking the fight in general, like I've had so many issues with people backing out, and it's like at the professional level, like what is that even? You know, how are you calling yourself a professional if you're not gonna actually show up to fight and also make money? Like that makes no sense to me. But yeah, it was just 12 to 6 elbows. I stopped it and then restarted the fight about like a minute later. And I finished it within like, I think 30 seconds from that point. I was just, you know, at that point I knew I had already felt him, felt the, the energy and knew that it was already, I had overcome his, his energy. So... I feel like that 12 to 6 elbow has been a topic of conversation lately in the MMA community. Do you think that should be a legal strike that they should change that in commissions around the state? Yeah, why not? I think you should also be able to kick grounded opponents to the head, you know, the way one championship does it, like a real fight. That's like certain rules like that. I I don't necessarily agree with but it is what it is you know if i have the chance to travel and actually fight in different promotions like one for example where i can fight under those rule sets i would be happy to and start training that way too which i already do and i see so many openings too when it comes to like throwing a knee to like somebody who's like all you have to do if you're if you're wrapped around the body is just put your hand down and all of a sudden that knee is no longer available which is like doesn't necessarily make sense to me because it's you're still at the same height you know it's still coming from the same distance it's like those those two roles i don't particularly agree with but it is what it is you know i i know that ufc has talked about changing things up a little bit over here in the states but i just don't know how it would do with like viewership you know yeah, and you mentioned how it didn't take you very long to get back in a dominant position when that fight was resumed, your pro debut. You were able to pull off a slick arm bar. How happy were you with the finish and, I guess, the, that overall performance in your pro debut? 
I was I was very pleased with it. You know, we I had a great I I do have a great team around me. You know, we took a lot of uh, measures to prepare properly for this. Shout out to all of my sponsors and my team. You know, Derek Tranchito, Jiu Jitsu, Shannon White. You know, the man's a wizard and lives for Jiu Jitsu. Same with Tran Cheeto. Cheeto is, I mean, the dude literally spends all day in the gym training people. He, this is his life. And like for a coach, that's something that I see valuing. You know, somebody that actually cares about the sport, cares about his fighters. Like, I remember uh, it was wild to me actually at um, like a Cage Thunder event recently. Um, unfortunately, a fighter that I actually know personally and comes to train at Chiro Jiu Jitsu had lost, you know. And it was wild to me that his corner from uh, Victory MMA, both of his corners, after his loss, they just left him there to walk out of the cage alone, you know. It's like how you, you just straight up prove that you do not care about your fight. Like, you should be there to support your fighter. You know, and they're they're always there for me by my side the entire night. Anything that I need, they will be there for it. Vince Morgan, Jeremy Hershkovitz, like those guys, I consider basically my managers, and they they really do a lot to help me out. You know, it's not like I can be working full time. I mainly try to train full time, so they'll help me out on that side of things, just to make the dream work. And I really do appreciate that. I do a lot. And shouts out to all my sponsors, too. Yeah, when you're picking up on those types of things, you know, cornering, and it sounds like you have a great mind for this business, maybe a future in coaching could be in, in the works for you, it sounds like, maybe. Yeah, I've already, uh, so I'm actually, I'm already cornering guys as we speak. Um, Apex Fight Systems is one of my three gyms that I travel to primarily. And with Apex, you know, Apex is, and I've said this before, Brian, Brian Clark is a great dude for providing the space for Apex. And th th there's so many young kids there that just need a little bit of direction. And, you know, somebody who to look up to in a way. And it's not like I, I mean, I do, I, I will say straight up that I do kind of want to be that person for them to kind of role model after in a way I try to do that for anybody. It's like, be respectful, you know, after every fight that I've had minus one, because, you know, guy was just not respectful to me. So I didn't feel respect to him. I bow to every single one of my opponents. I appreciate that they stepped up to, you know, take on such a, a challenge it's it's all about respect for me and like with apex there's a lot of young guys that i have you know taken upon myself to help coach when it comes to jujitsu and then mma knowledge in general brian's doing a good job of the striking knowledge so i try to make up for the other side of things which is the ground game and mma in general and uh, i mean I cornered six or seven guys out of that gym right now. With that experience being a corner man in MMA, what's, I guess, like, what does it take to be a good corner man in your role in, on the team? I always, like, one thing that I really, really try to stress on, or not stress on people, but, like, harp on people is to remain calm, like I do myself. And that comes through breath work. That comes through keeping a clear mind meditation, especially fight night you know and leading up to the fight night as we're doing sparring rounds and things like that i will also actively corner while my potential fighters are in the cage so that they can get used to my voice and get used to you know as soon as i say something they can do it relatively quickly and and you know when you do it in a timely manner things work out so it's all about timing in the sport and raining calm, not letting your heart rate get too high. You, you know, bringing the stress down, the heart rate goes down, you perform better. So like, and then, you know, when it comes to the jujitsu, 
I'm always like when it, Brian and I are together, I try to focus more on the jujitsu aspects of the fight where Brian will focus a little more on the striking. And it's just like a good combination that we have where, you know, both of our knowledge together helps make fighters actually perform the way they want to. And I mean, just have fun. You know, that's like, how often do you get to legally fight somebody and not catch any repercussions? You know, that's one of the best parts about it. I always try to remind guys of that. It's like, you can't fight in the streets and not like potentially actually injure somebody and then, you know, catch a charge from it. You, you can't do that. Yeah, that's a great point, too. I've talked to fighters in the past who have cornered teammates, and they talk about how they're more stressed cornering teammates than when it's them making that walk and they're competing themselves. It, can the same yeah, be said no, with I, your experience? Yeah, I definitely feel the stress. Like, I, I sometimes feel more stressed than some of the guys that I corner, you know? And, like, uh, the Paraback Twins, for example, I've only cornered Roman so far, but I plan to corner... Milan as well. And I mean, when Roman's fighting specifically, I'm, I'm nervous as shit just because he's got so much potential and it's like, he's doing so well, but it's like the, the risk is getting higher and higher, the further he goes. And that would be the same for Milan as he gets back into the circuit of things. And then, I mean, I mean, the only guy that I can honestly say out of apex that like did not stress me out at all was Bryce Nenig. That guy, when he made his debut, it was, I was just talking about this last night too. It was just hilarious. He had a smile on his face the whole time. And I'm just like actually trying to corner him. I see this dude like, you know, fighting him and just smile, just the biggest smile. I was just like, oh, he's having the time of his life. Like, this is, this is hilarious. Is that one of the few times that you've seen that in the fight game where a guy is just that happy yeah, to yeah, fight? You know, like, that's I crazy. Don't, I don't see that that often. Like, the whole time he was making his walk through the cage, he was just like, yes, <laughs> like, let's go. It was hilarious. Once again, this is Dusty the Warrior night. Schaefer here on Forge in Ohio. Your second pro fight took place two months after your fight in January. I'm assuming because you're pretty unscathed after the debut, but talk to me about the mindset going into your second pro fight. Yeah, so um, Zimic, Zimic, I knew he was going to be tougher. I knew he was a good grappler. He also had fought Abbas as well. So watching that fight, and you know what? And like, you want to go watch that fight yourself on YouTube? Go rewatch that fight. And anybody watching it, watching this in the future, I firmly believe that Zimic got robbed, straight up. So like. That was, that was just wild to me. And it was, it was a hometown fight for Abbas as well. I, I see that this dude is, you know, potentially someone that comes from maybe a wealthy background and has like the right, you know, resources behind him to make things work and build himself up. And, you know, like watching Zimic do that, I knew that. He was going to be a tough fight so the stress was there but just the way that i had done that camp <clears throat> was really really focusing on wrestling defense because you watch zimix a little bit of his film and he just loves to wrestle so if i shut that down what's he going to be able to do to me and the whole time it basically turned into a grappling match i maybe through like five or six elbows a head kick a knee to the jaw and a couple low kicks and that was about it the rest of it was all on grappling and that was the last round yeah it wasn't it was a split decision but like going back and watching it i don't like maybe you know but i feel that i had control the majority of the time i also had i believe two takedowns i know one for sure a lot of reversals, and I counted six triangle attempts, an normal plata attempt, a crucifix, um, a couple armbar attempts, and then the last round where he had uh, he actually slipped in a really so this is funny because he walked out to a stranglehold, all right, and 
then caught me and like i was I, watching it i was being lazy and i you know beat myself up for it but i'm just glad that i saw it i allowed him to take my back for a split second and this is the last round so like obviously he's going to go all out and try to get this secure this because he was behind so he sinks in a, a choke a rear naked choke and the entire time i just have stranglehold playing in my head and i was just like this is not happening right now like i am getting out or i am going out there's no other option i made the decision in my head and ended up getting out and from there i just actively started striking so i use i mentioned charles Oliveira. charles Oliveira has a certain striking style from like half guard using a knee shield and covering from guard so i had worked that with my corner man james moore in the past and james moore shouts out to james because that dude also lives for the sport he's one of the best corner men that i could ever ask for other than cheeto and then Corey wheeler for that specific fight you know they all love martial arts and like you know most people when they're scrolling on their phones they're looking at stupid shit. you know James, every time I see this dude on his phone, it's technique videos. Like this dude has thousands of dollars worth of technique videos that he just watches and watches and watches and then helps form my game through it. And I cannot appreciate him enough for that. So I used that Charles Oliveira striking from the ground, from my back to pretty much secure the win that round because I was just delivering blows that were solid blows you know like they i can feel it like the back of the hand hammer fist where the glove isn't covering perfect spot to strike so i have to ask about the stranglehold story because i've talked to fighters in the past who almost black out during their fights and they can't even remember what happened but hey they got their hand raised and that's all that matters for you to have the presence of mind in the moment to be singing that song in your head and then also refer to something that charles Oliveira does in that fight is that just your fighting style to be that aware of what's going on at all times yeah oh yeah and i try to remain as calm as possible when i'm in a high stress level situations like when i'm rolling at true art with all of my teammates and really actually anywhere if i roll with anybody i'm more of a like i'm not trying to absolutely murder you especially if i know that you're uh lower level than me i will let you get compromising positions on me and then for me i am a defensive jiu-jitsu player i i thoroughly enjoy letting people get chokes in on me and get you know very bad positions to put me in and then i work out of them and i think that really has a lot to uh i can really vouch for that being the reason that i was able to get out of that choke i knew exactly what i needed to do i remained calm i took like my last breath because he did actually like that choke was in i was not breathing but you know, like you can hold your breath for like a minute. So like, but it's a long time. I just, uh, you know, I said, all right, well, if I go out, I go out. But if I don't try to get out right now, I'm gonna lose, so. Yeah, there you go, man. So the fight on July 13th, it's gonna be your third fight this year, the third in a six month span. Is this the type of activity that you were looking for to start your pro career? Yeah, so I had, <clears throat> I had originally said this in my head that within six months, I wanted to get three fights and we are right on schedule. So it's every two months of fight and take minimal damage per fight. You know, obviously if there was damage taken, we'll take a little more time and recover. Um, I believe after this one is when I will take, depending on the opportunities that come up, I, I am looking to travel and start to broaden my reach of you know, training partners and just experience in general. I feel that I'm at that point now to where I got to start to level up a little bit through training with guys that are a lot better than me. So that's what I'm, I think that's going to be the plan after this fight, at least for a couple months, you know, finish out the rest of summer training and getting ready for the next year to come around. Now, if I can get maybe like two more fights and finish out a whole year, five and zero, oh, as a professional, I mean, I'd say that's pretty damn good. I'd say that making a statement versus also game opponents as well. You know, opponents that have winning records that are 
challenging. It's I'm not looking, you know, if you don't have a record that doesn't appeal to me, I'm honestly not interested. It's just like, I'll fight anybody, but like, it's like, is this going to actually test me? You know? Now, how does the body hold up having gone through two fights already this year? And I'm sure there's a physical toll that you're taking in the gym too. You're approaching your third fight and you might want to fight more this year after this one. So I do practice. I, I take a lot of measures for recovery. Um, I, you know, with this camp and I'm, I'm a daily runner too. So like my, my body's always moving. My body is always doing something. I train every day, multiple times a day, but then I try to really focus after training on, you know, stretching ice baths, which I was actually, I really wanted to do this interview in an ice bath, but unfortunately it started to thunderstorm as I was driving to my house in pretty intense lighting. So I felt that that would have been a little, not the safest, you know, plus the rain on the screen would have been kind of a pain in the ass, but yeah, I, I really focus on recovery. Sleep is very important. And then just my diet in general, I've uh, been able to clean up my diet. Thanks to my, my sponsor and also dietitian, Mike Walker. And he's also wrote not written up a workout plan for me. So I got back into weight training pretty consistently to really like, just make sure my body is fortified, you know? I'm building, I'm bulletproofing my body essentially for anything. And I have, I will say my body is very unique in a way to where it heals pretty fast. Like I did sustain a bit of like a, uh, maybe a stress or a bone chip from the last one. And I was good to go back at it within two weeks. So you know, and now it feels stronger than it ever has. It's weird. The calcification of my bones is really actually, you know, I think made my body the way that it is to where it can withhold. You're still very young at 27 years old with your physical prime still ahead of you. But is it safe to say yep. that I'm talking to the best version we've seen so far of Dusty Schaefer? Not even close. Is that an exciting still, is that an exciting feeling to know that you know as good as you are now there's still so much room for improvement and mastering to be done in areas to become an even better version of yourself. It is very exciting. I like that I like that question. That that's that's a good one. It's like I, the way I see it, you know, I turned pro at age 27. I I have a solid 10 years if not more, like I, you know, depending on how my body holds up, I might fight till 40. Like as long as I'm taking the right precautions, my, you know, my head's all right. My, you know, obviously that's the most important thing is your brain. And I'm taking the right measures to protect the brain. To have, and I'm hoping also within that time that technology advances to be able to help fighters with you know, issues like CTE or just bone and muscle injuries in general. I, you know, I intend on having a very long professional career and it's just getting started. Like it really, I look at this fight as this is kind of my, my breakout of, you know, really solidifying that I am who I say I am and I am really about this life. You know, I, I live for martial arts. What can you achieve in mixed martial arts, no matter how big or small in these 10 or so years that you're trying to compete, what can you achieve in the sport? You know, I'm, I'm hoping, not hoping, but what I will achieve is working through a promotion that is, you know, a high level. Now, whether it's UFC, whether it's one, uh, the, the Bellator, PFL merge, you know, whoever's paying, I, you know, I'm not like too picky about that. So like whoever's going to pay me and then help to provide the, the vision that I have to create for the MMA community here within Akron, Ohio, or to help assist 
with guys like Brian, for example, with Apex. You know, money, money with the MMA community, we're all starving artists. None of us really, we don't have time to work real jobs. You know, I, I don't necessarily. So like money's always an issue and I'm trying to like the vision that I have is to no longer have that be an issue to create a system where, you know, fighters who are actually like-minded like myself can train the way that they want to and have a facility to do so. So, and that's, uh, go on. I, I, that's like something similar, to like maybe the way that the strong style has like their facility for like their fight team and whatever, but like better. You know, and also within Akron, like everything seems to be up in Cleveland, but like everyone kind of slips past Akron and how special that city is. You know, so I'm also looking at myself as becoming the next athlete out of Akron, Ohio, other than, you know, the famous LeBron James. I would see myself at that level, but on in a different sport. For sure, man. Are those the, the things that motivate you? Are those the goals that you're fighting for every day and in every fight that you're competing in? Yeah, for sure. You know, that's like, this is an everyday grind. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take, it's going to take teamwork. I can't do it all myself. I can fight, you know, but like when it comes to the business side of things, I'm not like, you know, the most keen to it. I, I'd rather, you know, find the people that are and work together with them to make the vision come to life. All right. Well, the next stop for you <laughs> is July 13th. I can't wait for the fight. Before we wrap up, anything you want to shout out here at the back end of the show, I'll give you the floor here. Yeah. So, I mean, I mentioned my sponsors earlier. Um, we got Winking Sun is... <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so... Winking Sun was my first original sponsor that ever actually popped on board with uh, believing in me. Um, Jeremy, like I said, is not only a manager, but a sponsor of mine, Jeremy Hershkovitz. Um, Custom Home Exteriors, shouts out to them. Apollo Roofing and Supply. My merch, not this merch specifically, but over here. My merch was done by Bullseye Active Sportswear, which they did a very good job on it. Very nice. And this was something that I kind of went back and forth with them on to uh, create, and I intend on doing more as we go down the road to really start to uh, you know, create a brand to have people uh, rep and get the name out there even more, obviously. Mike Walker, my nutritionist. And uh, Whitey's Booze and Burgers. So Whitey's Booze and Burgers is, is my father's restaurant that he manages. It's basically how my family's built. They're, if nobody knows, they're out in Richfield. Go check them out. If you like a good burger, that's yeah, that's basically where I grew up. So I always have love for them. And uh, you know, just all my all my coaches, all my teammates, everyone that... You know, doesn't have to show up every day, but they still decide to, to help me, to help, we, and I help them as well. It's a mutual back and forth. And, you know, the, those guys, everyone at True Art and everyone at Apex and then Powers Martial Arts, shouts out to Ed Powers as well for providing that space. I, I cannot thank them enough, you know. They're all incredible people. I've made some of the coolest connections from mixed martial arts. A lot of people that are like-minded like myself and are just wanting to improve, you know? So, and, uh, yeah, I mean, we got also on that night, two other guys that I trained with specifically. And you also said that, uh, Mark Gordon was the last one on this podcast and Mark's a great guy. I'm excited to be fighting alongside him again. And I believe uh, Jordan Tag and also Jake Tavano are fighting that night. And Jordan comes to help us with wrestling. He's solid, dude. Um, but two guys on my team specifically that I've been helping train and get ready for their debuts are going to be Shane 
Shane Welsh and Walter Scrutchings. Both of those guys are Walter specifically is a young guy, somebody to look out for it for sure. So I'm excited to see how this plays out. It's going to be a good night. All right, there you have it. Thanks again, Dusty, for coming on the show. I appreciate you taking some time out of the weekend during camp ahead of what's a highly anticipated fight on July 13th. Before I let you go, I always do the OHIO chant with fighters who join me on the show. So if you could help me out here, OH. Oh, thanks, Let's Dusty. Go. Uh, thanks again for the time. Go get the job done on July 13th. I'm wishing you the best, and we'll talk again soon, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It was good talking. Thank you. That was Dusty the Warrior Schaefer, the 2-0 professional mixed martial artist. You can see Dusty fight in the co-main event of Made Men Promotions card this Saturday, July 13th in Cleveland, Ohio. I've had Mark Gordon and now Dusty Schaefer on Forge in Ohio in back-to-back -back weeks. They're both competing on that card. So is Alex Aleko Poinar out of Extreme Couture who joined the show in January. So feel free to check out that episode as well. As always, all episodes of Forge in Ohio can be found on the show's official YouTube channel and on all podcast platforms. It would mean a lot to me if you could download episodes like these videos and subscribe to the channel if you're new and for more content check us out on instagram and facebook at forged in ohio thank you all for watching or tuning in to another episode i've been your host jake murrin and this was forged in ohio